Welcome to the Ocean International Community Church. Um, I'm so excited that you guys are here this morning um, because you could have been anywhere right now. You could have probably been in your bed still, but you chose to be here in the presence of God. And it's just amazing to have you guys here and to see you guys this morning as I get to minister the word of God to you today. So let me start by introducing myself. My name is Ephraim, but everybody calls me Effie here at the Ocean. I am one of the leaders here at the Ocean, and um, it's such an honor and a privilege to be here before you guys to minister the Word of God to you. Um, so today, we are on the third week of our sermon series, Servolution. And um, I don't know about you, but I know that, um, that the past two weeks have been a huge, huge blessing to me. Um, has anybody in here been helped by the sermon series? Anybody so far? Yes? Okay, I see a few hands up there. Well, you know what? I know for sure that this sermon series has really, really challenged me. You know, um, Edgar last week, um, he talked about us choosing to be sheep and to not be goats. And so this entire week, you know, I was just um, going through the week and I'm like, God, you know, I don't want to be a goat. I don't want to be a goat. Jesus, being a goat is not my portion. I'm not about that life. You know, God, I want to be a sheep. I don't want to be a goat. You know, and for those of you who don't even understand what I'm talking about, I would suggest that you go to our YouTube channel and watch um, the, past two, um, the past two sermon series um, that Edgar preached and you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. But basically, we are on a sermon series called Re um, Servolution, which basically it's a coining of the word revolution and service. And so what we're talking about here is that we as believers, we are called to a revolutionary type of service. Um, I truly pray that by the time that we are done with the sermon series, that your mindset and your understanding of what serving is will have gone to a deeper level. Like you'll understand it in a different light and you'll understand it more deeply, so much so that it's going to charge you and move you to want to register and to start serving, you know, here at church. But you need to also understand that serving is not limited to just the church. You know, you can serve wherever you are, wherever God has placed you. You can serve at home. You know, and we're going to talk more about that next week. But um, we want to move people to start serving, to become a people who serve wherever there is a need in our community. Now, in this sermon series, we want you to understand that Servolution, it's not an event or it's not a program, but Servolution is a culture. It is a culture of sacrifice. It is a culture of service. And this is not just any ordinary service, but it is a service that actually radically and completely changes the lives of the people that we serve. That is what a servolution is. You know, and nobody did this better than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was the one that brought about this revolutionary type of service. And this is not to say that before him that there weren't people that weren't serving. We had slaves who were serving in homes. You know, we had people serving in the temples. But there was something about the way that Jesus served that ended up changing the entire meaning of what service was. And so today, I want us to learn from Jesus on how can we serve in a revolutionary type of way, in a way that we will change the lives of the people around us, in a way that will leave a long-lasting impact in the lives of the people around us. Because you see, servolution is not just a call to action. Servolution, it is a call to being. We are called to be servants. And so if that's who you are, then it means that everywhere you are, anytime you are on duty. You, are, you can serve anywhere and anytime because servolution, it's a call to being. And so this morning, I want us to um, turn our Bibles to the Gospel of John chapter 13. Or for those of you with mobile devices, like Edgar said last week, swipe with me to John chapter 13. Um, we will be reading the first five verses of the chapter, and then we'll jump to verse 12. And this is what the Word of God says. John chapter 13, verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Now Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. 
I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Father, we thank you for your word because, Lord, we know that in this word there is life. And this morning, Jesus, I pray that as we dissect your word, God, as we learn more about what true service is, Father, I pray that we'll find the life in it. And God, I pray that you will use me this morning as your vessel, Jesus, because that is what I am, Lord. Father, may you speak through me, and Lord, may every word that comes out of my mouth go plant a seed in the hearts of people this morning. Because God, we want to become revolutionaries. So Father, I just surrender myself to you, God, and I ask you to have your way in me and have your way in the service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, this story, it opens in an upper room where Jesus and his disciples were. And so Jesus and his disciples were meeting in this upper room to have a Passover meal. Now, for those of you who don't know what Passover was, Passover is a Jewish holiday where they were commemorating Israel's deliverance from slavery in Egypt. So now this was going to be Jesus' last Passover meal with his disciples because he knew very well that in less than 24 hours, he was going to be bitten, he was going to be humiliated, he was going to be rejected, and he was going to be crucified. But of course, his disciples at this time, they had no idea. But you see, the interesting thing is that they were going to learn something so significant in this night. And that's what I want us to learn about this morning. So... It happened that in those days, in the first century, these people did not have, they didn't have the shoes that we have today. Most of them often wore sandals. And so if somebody went into somebody's house, the servant of that house had to wash that person's feet. Now, of course, we have like an array of shoes, you know, we have different brands and all sorts of shoes. We are spoiled for choice. I think we're actually such a spoiled generation. You know, if you turn to your right, you know, you've got your Timberland boots, you know, you turn to the left, you've got all sorts of formal shoes. You've got your sneakers like your All-Stars, your J's, your Yeezys. You know, the ladies have got those expensive, those red bottoms, those bloody shoes, you know, the ones I'm talking about. Like, you know, we just have like an array of options. But these guys did not have that luxury. You know, these guys, all they had was just sandals. And now I imagine that the disciples at this point in time, they had walked a long distance, you know, with Jesus, you know, probably after doing a lot of ministry. And so it was hot and humid. And so their feet were smelly. They were walking in dust and probably encountered some mud. So their feet were pretty nasty. But now they get into this house and it's just Jesus and the disciples. There was no servant there to wash their feet. Now, I'm sure at this point in time, everybody's like, okay, so who's going to be the person who's going to wash everybody's feet? Definitely, Peter's like, I'm sure, no, it's not going to be me. You know, James is like, nope, not me. John, not me. Philip, well, not me. So everybody's like, okay, who's going to be the one who's going to wash the other person's feet? And so everybody pretends as if they don't know that it's customary that people need to wash people's feet. So, of course, they, you know, they sit down about to have this meal. And I'm sure at this point in time, they're all, like, looking at each other. You know, like, it's one of those awkward situations where you know that something has to be done. But nobody wants to do it, so everybody pretends to be busy. I'm sure some of them were probably like looking at each other or pretending to be talking about something important just so as to wait for somebody to raise up their hands and be like, okay, guys, you know what, fine, I'll do it. Kind of like when you're in a setting or you're in a room like this, and I'm like, hey, guys, so we're about to start a ministry here um, where we need people to scrub toilets. Who will volunteer to do it? You know, then suddenly you find that in the entire room, everybody's suddenly like on their phones, you know, typing something because suddenly they got a WhatsApp text. You know, or people looking at each other, or some people staring at the wall, because nobody wants to be the person to volunteer. But Jesus does something so amazing in this moment. So Jesus is like, you know what, since these guys are not going to do it, since nobody's going to volunteer, then well, you know what, I'm going to teach them a lesson. So then Jesus gets up from where he was sitting, and then he goes and takes the towel, he takes the basin, and he takes the pitcher of water, and then he begins to wash each of the disciples' feet. Jesus had to wash 12 nasty feet. Now, mind you, in those days, the servants who would wash feet, they were, like at the, were considered to be at the bottom of the food chain. So even if you were a slave in a house, you, the person who actually washed feet was like the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the slaves, like the least of all the slaves was the one who had the job. So I can imagine in this, in this scenario, if somebody didn't know who these people were, or if you didn't know who Jesus was and the disciples, you would actually think that Jesus is a slave. Because what Jesus decided to do is that he chose to take the position of a servant to serve the disciples by washing their feet, because none of them were willing to do it. Now, I want you to look at it this way. 
Jesus, knowing very well that he's the son of God, knowing very well who he is, he chose to take the decision to wash the disciples' feet. Because Jesus could have well, very well told the disciples that, hey, somebody, he could have picked anybody like Peter, um, why don't you wash everybody's feet? But he didn't do that because he knew that by what he was about to do, that he would teach them a great lesson that they would end up um, applying in their own lives and in their service in ministry. And so Jesus, yes, he gets down, Jesus washes their feet, and then he sits back at the table, and then they continue with their conversations. Now, what I want us to get from this, um, from this story in the Bible is that Jesus did a selfless act of love. Jesus, he humbled himself. Jesus being God, being the Son of God, being the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he humbled himself, and he began to do the least job that nobody wanted to do, and he washed the disciples' feet. Now, there are so many profound lessons in this story, and we're going to go through that this morning. Now, last week and the week before that, Edgar told us all that we are all called to be servants. Because if you're going to be a follower of Christ, then you are going to emulate the life of Christ. And Christ lived a life of service. So being a Christian is equivalent to being a servant. You can't separate servanthood from Christianity because it's part and parcel of, of who we are as Christians. Now, you see, the problem with most of us modern-day Christians is that we like to pick and choose what we like from our Christianity. You know, we treat Christianity like a pack of M&Ms where what we do is like, I pick the colors that I like and I eat those and then I discard the rest. You can't do that. If you're going to choose to be a follower of Christ, then you have to be willing to live it as is. You have to be willing to follow Jesus as he lived his life. And Jesus lived a life of service. Now, as Jesus served, everywhere he went, everywhere he served people, he changed lives. And some of us here today, actually all of us here in this room, we are beneficiaries of Jesus' service. And so let me ask you this question. How many people will benefit from your service 100 years from now? Like, is the service that you are employing right now, how you are serving other people, is it going to impact people 100 years from now? Because all of us here, we are reaping benefits of the service that Jesus did and some of these guys um, who started the early church. Now, the reason why Jesus type of serving changed the world and impacted generation is because Jesus served with love and Jesus served with humility. Love and humility are the key element to a solution type of service. This is what separates the mere servanthood to a radical, life-changing servanthood that we're talking about, which is servolution. Love and humility. And so I'm going to break it down to you this morning, how love and humility is so important in our service so that we can be able to impact the lives of people. So what is humility? In Philippians chapter 2, um, Paul tells us that do nothing out of selfish ambition, but in humility consider or value others above yourself. And do not look into your own interests, but rather look, um, look out for the interests of each other. But then it gets even more interesting from verse 5, where Paul says that we must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Paul tells us that we must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Why is attitude important? Attitude is important because your attitude influences your actions. Your attitude directs your actions. So if you have a negative attitude towards something, chances are how you are going to execute that thing will be in a very mediocre way because attitude influences your actions. Now Paul is telling us we are to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus had. Now what was that mindset? It was the mindset of humility. Jesus embodied humility. And because this is the attitude that he had, then it sipped in every area of his life, even including his service. So he even served people with humility. And so what is humility? Humility is choosing to value other people or to consider other people above yourself. Being willing to go against yourself to serve other people. Being willing to put the needs of other people before yours, even if it inconveniences you, because there is a need to be met. That is humility. It's not looking at self. It's not looking at what I want. 
and what I feel like doing, but rather it's looking at there is a need and I'm going to meet that need because that's what humility does. Humility looks at the other person and values that other person above themselves and they choose to go against themselves and they do something for that person. Now, Jesus always served people with humility. He was a humble servant. Jesus served lepers, people like, you know, that, that nobody wanted to touch. He served um, a paralytic man. He healed a paralytic man. Jesus healed a blind man with mud. So Jesus literally, he went on the floor, picked up mud, and he put in the, you know, in the blind man's eyes, and he healed him. Now, of course, some of us, even if we're called to do something, sometimes we may be required to do something that may re really require us to literally get dirty. We'll not be willing to do it because we're like, well, you know what? My perfectly manicured hands are going to get dirty, so I can't do that. But Jesus was like, you know what? I'm going to do whatever it takes to serve these people because there is a need. I am going to meet that need. I don't care what people think. I don't care how uncomfortable it makes me because there's a need to be met and I want to serve people. Because you see, a humble servant recognizes that they are not called to look down upon anyone or any task. A humble servant is willing to help somebody or a community despite anything, as long as they get to help them. That's what a humble servant does. So it wasn't an issue for Jesus to stoop down low and wash the disciples' feet because he was humble. Because he knew by him washing their feet, it didn't, um, it didn't take away from who he was. He was still the son of God. His identity in God was secure. You know, but he did that because he wanted to serve them, because somebody had to do it. There's no way that they were going to eat, you know, like that in that state of, you know, having filthy feet around the table. And so Jesus chose to wash their feet. He stooped down low and did it. Now, my thing is this. If the Son of God, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords can stoop down low and serve and wash people's feet, who are we that we cannot do the same? Who are we that we are not willing to stoop down low and do whatever it takes to serve people. Because can I tell you something, church? Serving people is not always going to look glamorous. Serving people doesn't always look like this. This is not what I always do all the time. There are times where I have to go out and do things that make me uncomfortable. I have to do things that are not the coolest, they're not the most glamorous, where I don't have to wear my best clothes. But you know what? Since there is a need to be met, I have to do it because that's what true service is. You know, what if today there is a need that, okay, you know what, we need to go to one of the slums, you know, in Dar, and we need to go clean up that area. Would we be willing to go? Or would we be thinking like, well, you know what, I don't think I can do that. That's not my ministry because, well, you know what, I don't want to get dirty. I don't want to get sweaty. I can't deal with those people. No. We, as long as there is a need somewhere, we have to be willing to meet that need because that is what serving in humility is. And so with Jesus, whenever there was an opportunity to serve, Jesus served. Jesus always put other people above himself. Jesus was not selfish. Jesus was so selfless, and so he always met a need wherever the need was. And so I really want us to understand that without humility, we will never be able to have a revolutionary type of service. Because the only way that we can completely and radically change people's lives is being willing to serve them wherever they are. Because at the end of the day, the purpose of this revolution is to lead people to Jesus. But if you're not serving people, if you're not willing to do what it takes to serve the people, how are you going to change the lives of people? How are you going to touch the lives of people? How are you going to impact people's lives? You know, I, there, for, there are people for me in my life that I will never forget them because of the things that they did for me, because of how they served me. That up until the day that I'll die, I'll always remember those people and what they did for me because that's the lasting impact they've left in my life. Now, how many of us are willing to do the same for somebody else. That you're willing to do something, to go out of your own way, to do something so great for somebody that they'll never forget you. Because that is what a revolution requires. It is not, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. And I'm not going to stand here and lie and say that, you know what, it's easy for some, for some of us, you know, to really just decide to put other people before us because by nature, we're very selfish. By nature, we're very self-centered. You know, so... It has to get to the place where we're like, you know what, God, I am going to check myself. I'm going to leave my pride at the door, and then I'm going to go and serve you. Because you cannot serve people the way that Jesus served them if you still have a chip on your shoulder. It's going to be hard for you to do certain things because you feel like you're too good for that. There was nothing that was beneath Jesus. There was no need that was beneath Jesus. Jesus met every need as long as he could meet that need. And you 
are called, I am called to serve people in that manner, to serve people in that attitude that, you know what, there is nothing that is beneath me. There is a need and I'm available. I can meet that need. Then you know what, I'm going to do it. But the reason why we often don't do that and we miss the opportunity of changing people's lives is because we're so prideful. And so this morning, I want you to understand that from today, you and I need to get off our high horses. So turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, get off your high horse. horse. Turn to your other neighbor and tell them, get off your high horse. horse. Exactly. You and I are to get off our high horses because we cannot serve people while we are still prideful because then we won't be willing to go all the way. Jesus was willing to go all the way. Jesus was ready to put other people's needs before, before himself. And that way he was able to change people's lives. There are people, actually, whether you know it or not, that have chosen to put their needs, to put their needs back and to put your needs before them to serve you. You know, some of us, we get the privilege to even just come here, you know, and it's comfortable, the ACs are on, the lights are set, you know, the TV screens, you know, the projector, whatever, everything is set. But there is somebody who chose to wake up at 6 a.m. to be here. There is somebody who chose to sacrifice their sleep to be here so that you and I can be comfortable here in this space. There is somebody who was like, you know what? I will sacrifice my sleep. I will sleep after third service when I get home, but I'm going to go to church and set up so that the people that are going to come, they'll be able to be comfortable. That is serving with humility. It's being willing to put other people's needs before yours. And so today I'm asking you, church, that we have to be a people who are willing to go above and beyond to serve people. A people who are willing to be selfless and to stop focusing on ourselves and begin to meeting the needs around us. Now, the other element of a servolution is love. Jesus served with love. And that is why wherever Jesus went, whenever he served people, people always wanted to follow him thereafter because they were drawn to the love that he had. There was something different about him because it's not as if that other people were never there who served. People served, but there was just something magnetic about the way that Jesus served. There was something magnetic about the way Jesus related to people that people gravitated towards him. And it's that love. I know I came to Jesus because I was drawn to his love. Most of us were here in this room because of the love of Jesus. And so Jesus used that love because he he was love. He carried love. He even employed that in his service to people. Because you see, when you serve with love, you will be selfless. Because love is selfless. Love is not selfish. Love is unconditional. You will serve unconditionally. Because that's what love does. Love doesn't expect anything in return. You will not serve people with strings attached. Because you know sometimes we can serve people and you're sort of like investing of sorts. And you're like, you know what, I'm going to serve you this time around. But then I'll come one day and I'll make a call and you're going to do something for me. That's not serving the way Jesus served. Jesus served with no strings attached. He served wholeheartedly. He gave his all to everybody that he met. And that's the kind of love that we need to show people. That is how we are to serve. Because without love, all that we do is nothing. Without love... We will serve people while we're complaining and grumbling. You know, while we're serving as if like we're being forced to be there because we don't have love for the people that we're serving and we're not serving with love. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, you know, um, going to a restaurant and then you meet a waiter or a waitress who has so much attitude. You know, you are, you're there to have a nice meal with your family or with your friends. You know, you guys are in, in a good mood. And then this waiter or waitress comes that has attitude for days. You know, and they're there, they're taking your order while they're sulking, so they're being forced to be there. And I'm like, okay, but I'm not paying you. You're the one that, you know, applied for this job. You are here. Why are you treating me with so much attitude? But okay, let's, let me try to be nice. You know, they're rolling their eyes, they're dragging their feet, they get your order wrong, and they don't even apologize, you know, and it's just, this is being plain old rude. Chances are, when the bill comes and you have to tip them, and fortunately in Tanzania, when you're not forced to tip, so you tip them based on how you feel like, Chances are you won't tip them. And probably even amongst yourself, you'll be like, well, should we tip her or him? You'll be like, ah, no, her service was horrible, so no, we're not going to tip and we're just going to leave. You know, but you will tip her based on how he or she served you. Isn't that true? You know, and so that's the same thing with our service, that how we serve people is so important because if we serve them with a negative attitude, if we serve them while we're complaining and grumbling, while we're sulking, then you know what, that energy, they will feel that energy and they will know 
And they will never want to come back and be served by us because you know what? Nobody wants to be, for, wants to be served by somebody who feels like they are forced to serve. You want somebody to serve you because they feel that, you know what, I love you and so I'm going to serve you. And that way they'll serve, you, they'll serve you wholeheartedly. And so we need to serve people with love because service without love equals nothing. Service without love will not change the lives of people. Service without love, it will not draw people to Jesus because we are his hands and feet here on earth. And so if we can serve Jesus, if we can serve people in a way that draws them to Jesus, then what's the point? What's the point? You know, I see um, how our Kurasini um, orphanage ministry here, you know, when they go to, to visit those kids at Kurasini, those kids will come running and jumping at them, you know, and it's because they feel the love. Those kids are drawn to the love of our volunteers who go there every Sunday. Had they served them reluctantly, I don't think those kids would respond to them because one interesting thing about kids, kids are the most honest people. You know, if a kid likes you, they like you. If they don't like you, they don't like you. Kids don't pretend. We can pretend. I can pretend that I like you, but I actually don't. But with kids, they don't pretend. Kids will respond to you based on how exactly they feel about you. You know, and I take that as such a good example because those kids, whenever they see our people go there, they just will just come running to them and they'll never want to let them go because our people go there and serve them with love. And that's what love does. You know, so when we serve as if we're being forced, I'm telling you guys, we will not give our best. We will do the bare minimum. And that will not change the lives of people. That will not draw people to Jesus. That will not revolutionize our service. We need to serve people with love. In fact, 1 Corinthians um, chapter 13, verse 3, it says, If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship, that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Even if I give all my possession to the poor and I give over my body to be burned, but if I do not have love, I have gained nothing. It's all for show. It's all for nothing. Because love is everything. Love is at the center of everything. And for us as Christ followers, we're supposed to be known as people who love. And so even how we serve, we're supposed to serve in a manner that is loving, in a way that it will draw people to come to us, in a way that people want to be served by us again and again and again because they feel the love of Jesus. You know, one of the very vivid testimonies as well in this church um, is every Sunday when we have newcomers, we ask them to sign this connection card. You know, and in the course of the weeks, you know, we have a follow-up team that follows up, follows up with them. And, they, of course, they get to sort of like write their remarks, whether, how the experience was and stuff like that. And I tell you, the amount of people who are like, man, I will definitely come back because I felt loved at the church. It was amazing. It was so good. I felt at home. You know, people just feel loved. And that's because the people that serve in all the different areas, from the greeters, from the ushers, you know, from everybody that serves, they serve them with love. And that's what keeps people coming back, that love. Because there are people who have gone to other churches and they didn't feel the love of Jesus. They didn't feel that love and so they never go back. There are other people that I know who stopped going to church because they felt condemned. Because they felt that, you know what, um, these people, they don't even care about me. They don't like me. They don't love me. But you see, when you serve people with love, I guarantee you people will be drawn to that love because at the end of the day, what we all want is to be loved. What we all want is to be loved. You know, and so without love, our service is futile. Yes, I may look good. I may look like I'm doing something so significant. But if I'm not doing it with love, it's pointless. I have nothing. My service is nothing. It's pointless. And actually, in this moment, I'm actually hearing Whitney Houston's voice. I have nothing nothing but yeah but you get my point though you know like without love I have nothing it's pointless it's useless you might as well not even do it so if we are to serve people the way that God wants us to serve in a revolutionary kind of way we are to serve people with love so church I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them you better serve me with love, serve with love. turn to your other neighbor and tell them you better serve me with love, better serve with love. now you see, everybody's excited at the fact that, yeah, you better serve me with love. So now you turn to your neighbor and tell them, I'm going to serve you with love. Uh -huh. Tell them to your other neighbor, I'm going to serve you with love. Exactly. Go and serve people with love today. Now, in closing, I just want to ask you one more question. 
Do you want God to use you to point people in your life to him? Does anybody in here want God to use them to point people in their lives to Jesus? Anybody? Only two, three, four people? Wow. So the rest of you, you do not want God to use you to, eh, to lead people to him. No, can you be, please just keep your hands raised. I want, I want to see everybody who really wants to be used by God to point people to him. Great. Now for all of you who have raised your hand, the answer is simple. Serve those people around you. But don't just serve them anyhow. Serve them with love and humility. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, God, for setting an example for us on how true servanthood looks like. Father, we thank you because we know that, God, we are to serve people with love. And, Father, without love, everything that we're doing is futile. And so, God, I pray that even as we live here today, God, Father, may we live knowing very well that we are called to serve and that we are called to serve people with love. And so, God, whatever that spirit of pride is in us, God, I pray today that you take it away, Jesus. Lord, may we get off our high horses and be willing to serve people like the way other people serve us. Father, I pray that you change the way that we see servanthood. Father, let us not see it as a burden, but let us see it as an opportunity to change the lives of people. God, I pray that you just change our hearts. Father, may you humble us, God. May you humble us, Jesus. Help us see ourselves for who we really are and for how we're supposed to view ourselves, Jesus. Nobody is too high and mighty to serve. Nobody is too high and mighty to meet the needs of people. If you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, can meet the needs of people, then we can too. So, Father, I pray today that even as we go home, Father, may we reflect on this message. And, Father, may we remember that you have called each and every one of us to serve with love and humility. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen.